Hello folks, welcome back, sorry, squeeze chair there. Hello folks, welcome back to Higher Chemistry Reaction Rates Part 3. Um, in Parts 1 and 2 we talked about um, a little new concept for calculating relative rate um, and how it works. We looked at the shapes of the graphs if you have changing the concentration or changing the temperature. In Part 2 we looked at why the graphs are like they are. Uh, we looked at this collision theory uh, and what it explains about reaction rates. In part three today, I would like to have a look at how the witchcraft of catalysts actually work. Um, and to do that, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to introduce this concept here. I hinted at this when I said in collision theory that collisions can be unsuccessful if the atoms don't have enough energy. So that's to do with this concept here. But before we do that, I'm going to draw a graph that we're going to see a lot in the reasonably near future. It's called a potential energy graph. Um, I'm tempted to change its name to enthalpy, but we'll come back to that later. Let's put a potential energy um, on the y-axis. And it's called a few things along here. I tend to refer to it as just time. Uh, the SQA often calls it reaction progress. It just means as the reaction happens, from the start to the finish, along this axis here. Um, these are all sketch graphs. There's, there's no numbers on them yet. Um, so, what do we have? Well, for example, if we had um, two hydrogen atoms and a molecule um, and we bring it close to a pair of oxygens, um, then we're going to get a big long, loud bang and uh, we're going to have our ear ringing and we're going to make some water. Um, so the reaction, of course, we're dealing with is H2O. H oh, H2O, sorry. It's been a while since I've been working in class, obviously. H2 plus uh, half O2 makes H2O. Just take that for example, it's, it's nice because I like it because it makes big bangs. Um, so we will start, these are our reactants of course, and this is our product. So reactants are going to be down here at the start of the reaction progress and our products are going to be over here. Now we have not talked about this very much, I think I hinted at it a long time ago in third year, that um, these lines which of course we know are covalent bonds, shared pairs of electrons, but they're a lot more than that. They are the source of all chemical reaction energies. So every time you um, light a flame um, or cook a chicken or whatever, you are actually changing these bonds, and these bonds are effectively stored energy, believe it or not. We haven't talked about this much, but there is energy stored in these bonds. I'm going to throw this word at you just now, and we'll come back to it later in the course. There is a fancy name for that stored energy, and it is called enthalpy. Which is why I was debating just to call this axis here enthalpy. So basically, potential energy is the energy stored in your bonds. And you can see that the bonds we start with, our HH and OO, are definitely not the same as the bonds that we make for our products because we end up making HO bonds. So you're going to start with a certain amount of energy stored here and finish with a different amount. And that's what this potential energy graph shows you. So why don't we start at a completely random place. Let's say we start here and we'll end um, somewhere down here. Um, I, yeah, I've left the middle blank here intentionally. Oops, I just subconsciously drew, <laughs> I just subconsciously drew the middle there with my left hand, spoiler alert, um, because the middle of the graph looks like this. So this is a potential energy graph. Uh, here we have got H2 and a half a mole of O2 molecules, and here we've got one mole of water. Now there's a few things to have a look at on this graph. Um, we'll come back to these later on in the course, but the thing I want to tackle today is this guy here, activation of energy. Um, this, by the way, was what my thesis was about in fourth year, because what we actually start with are um, molecules like this. And from collision theory, we know that these are about to just bash into each other. So we are going to break these old covalent bonds and we are going to just start to form some new covalent bonds. 
and that actually is a thing. It's called the activated complex. So the activated complex is extremely unstable. It only exists for tiny fractions of a second. We're talking like 1 times 10 to the minus 14 here. Um, at room temperature, anyway. Uh, and I was trying to slow this thing, this whole process down and take snapshots, as aware of this, of this activated complex. Now, it doesn't look very stable, does it? Um, and where does it exist on this graph here? The SQA um, would like you to know this. You can pause the video, by the way, take five seconds to think where might this exist on this curve. If we were in a classroom, of course, I'd select a random few people and see what they thought. So if you want to pause it and have a cogitate and come back to me. Okay, we're back. Activated complex exists up here. Here is your activated activated complex, sorry, that's where it exists, and it of course makes perfect sense, it's halfway between the reactants and the products, and it's at the highest energy. This thing just wants to fall apart. Please note, by the way, remember I said unsuccessful collisions? Well, it can go backwards. It can fall apart, these new bonds can get wiped, and you can recreate the old bonds. Or, of course, if you have successfuls, then you end up making the new bonds. So it can actually go either way here from the activity complex. And as you can probably figure out, there's an energy difference here between where we start and the formation of this. And of course, if you haven't worked out already, that is the activated comp act activation energy. I do apologize. The activation energy is the minimum amount of energy we have to supply in order to break apart the old bonds and just start forming the new ones. In other words, to make an activated complex. That's the definition of activation energy. So that is the activation energy. Later on in the course, I'm going to come back to the significance of the difference between these two levels. But not just now. Life's complex enough. Um, what is this? What's the consequence of the activation energy in the real world? Well. Um, one of the consequence, consequences of this is that different reactions require different amounts of activation energy. Um, I'm probably going to link uh, the end of this uh, to a video uh, from the Royal Society of Chemistry about a compound called nitrogen triiodide. Um, it's got a ridiculously low activation energy. Um, if you tap it with a feather, you provide enough kick to start the reaction off. At the other end of that, ironically, and it's also an explosive, is a chemical like a uh, plastic explosive, or as Americans call it, C4, um, which you can use um, for blowing holes in steel. Uh, and it has a surprisingly high activation complex. You can actually throw plastic explosive in a fire. You can throw a stick of dynamite in a fire and it won't actually go bang because you haven't provided enough activation energy. If you don't give enough activation energy, you'll be somewhere on this side of the slope and you can have collisions, but they will always be unsuccessful because you haven't ripped apart the old bonds and formed the activated complex yet. Um, just for illustration of that, so uh, here would be an example of a reaction which has very, very small Activation energy. So here's where you start. There's your activation energy. And here we have an example of a reaction that has got a really high activation energy. So the activation energy is from where you start to the highest point. Happy with that? By the way, you notice that at the moment I'm always starting higher and finishing lower, and that's not always true. A nice example of that would be roast chicken, for example. That is an endothermic reaction. You've got to provide the reaction energy all the time. You turn the oven off halfway through the reaction, you don't. You stop cooking the chicken. It doesn't continue to cook by itself. That would be nice, but it doesn't happen. Um, when you start higher and finish lower, then these are called exothermic reactions. That's like set fire to a piece of paper. You don't continue to supply the flame. You can take the flame away and... Uh, the reaction still happens. If you have the endothermic versions of these, let's do an endothermic reaction. 
you start low and finish high. The SQA are often keen to give you one of these because everybody tends to do exothermics as examples. So where on earth would um, the activation energy be for this one? It's the same as I hinted at and said a couple of times. It's from where you start to the highest point. So the activation energy is exactly the same from where you start to the highest point on that graph. Okay with that folks? Just like to pause the video for just two seconds. Right folks, so the question is, uh, we started with this sheet here and we said catalyst, how does the how does the witchcraft of a catalyst work? And I said it's got something to do with this. Um, so if we take a reaction um, potential energy diagram, say, and it looks something like this. And just for ease of um, illustration, we're going to start putting some numbers in here. So this is potential energy um, or enthalpy or energy stored. Remember in the bonds, that's that's what we have here. Um, by the way, if you're reasonably bright, you've probably worked out why this is an exothermic reaction. Because these are your reactants with a higher energy level stored. These are your products with a lower energy stored. Where's this energy gone? The answer is, it's come out into the environment. It's now burning your hand because it's an exothermic reaction. And that's why explosives go bang. That's a big drop. We'll come back to that later on though when we talk about enthalpy properly. Um, so uh, for the moment, let's put some numbers on this. Arbitrary numbers, 100, and for easy counting, say 200 here. Which means uh, the activation energy for this reaction here, um, of course, is 100 kilojoules per mole. Um, this is for the basic reaction. What if we were to throw a catalyst into the mix? Um, so here's our catalyst. That's at this point being married to an art teacher. I'm terrified to let her see this. There's my a terrible at drawing hands. There's my catalyst. Sorry about that. It just had to be done. Couldn't resist it. Especially when you're a captive audience in video. Um, what happens if we apply the catalyst? Well, I'm going to do the catalyzed reaction in blue. Now, if you see in text, I'll come back to how textbooks show it. I'm just going to show it the simple version. There's my catalyzed reaction. You will note two things of importance. Number one, if we put a number in here, say 120-ish, uh, the activation energy is defined as from where you start to the highest point. Now, the highest point now is there, which means our activation energy with a catalyst in blue is only 20 kilojoules per mole. In other words, five times lower. Um, there's another thing I want you to note, which is we start and finish at the same heights. Of course, we start and finish at the same heights because those heights are governed by the bonds in your reactants and the bonds in your products. We haven't changed them. Still the same reactants, still the same products. What the catalyst has done is it has managed to lower the activation energy. Um, one of the ways that it can do that is an example in your car exhaust systems. Um, there are catalysts and they turn uh, molecules of carbon monoxide, which is extremely dangerous, into molecules of carbon dioxide before they come out the exhaust pipe. And uh, the way they work is they have um, a surface made of usually palladium, uh, platinum, or rhodium, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and as the passing molecules come along, they stick onto the surface of the catalyst. So here's our carbon monoxide structure. Please don't ask me why there's only three bonds in carbon there. I'll come back to it another day. Um, and what the catalyst does is it weakens these bonds. And if you remember, up here, activated complex up here. The activated complex is just as the old bonds are breaking apart and the new bonds are forming. It's the highest energy state. And of course, if we can make it easier to break these bonds, then that's what's happened here. This is the activated complex with a catalyst. This is the activated complex without a catalyst. Faster reaction in blue, much slower reaction in black. 
And that explains the witchcraft of catalysts. They grab the passing molecules, they weaken the bonds, another oxygen comes along, forms a nice extra bond, and then that whole molecule detaches from the surface of the catalyst as carbon dioxide. And this remains totally unchanged. Ta-da! That's the witchcraft of catalysts explained. Just going to pause this for just two seconds. Sorry, I was just checking the exact SQA wording. Um, so they define a catalyst as something which provides an alternative pathway for the reaction to happen and in the process lowers the activation energy. Um, biologists, of course, call them enzymes. They work in a slightly different way, um, but they're really handy considering they keep all of us alive. We would be impossible to live without enzymes, which are just biological catalysts. And I think that's all I want to say on the subject. Thanks for listening, folks.